Hello everybody, this is Zach Tedded again. I'm your host, Zach Cooley, and it is an honor for me to be here with Early Clover. He is the lead singer of the first ever group to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and they are coming to our beloved Millwall Theater in Whitfield, Virginia on October 5th. Um, Mr. Early Clover, it is an honor to have you on the phone this morning. Thank you for doing the show. Uh, Mr. Cooley, uh, uh, should I call you Zach? You may call me Zach, please. Okay, Zach, it, it's a pleasure to do so. We are we are honored. We always honored to enter to enter any city, state, in this country to entertain our fans. Um, it, it's a pleasure to be on your show. Well, it is an honor to have you. Um, let me tell you something about uh, what the coasters mean to me personally. I will turn 40 this spring in March, and when I was about 13, all my friends were out ripping and running and doing their thing, and I was born bound to a wheelchair with cerebral palsy, uh, unable to go out like my other peers, and what I would do, we had here in Whitfield, it's a very small town, we have about 8,000 people uh, only one radio station, and it was, and it was bluegrass and country all day long. And then finally, about when I was thirteen, they switched to to FM, and they had an oldie station. Well, back then you don't even have oldie stations anymore. But back then, oldie stations meant strictly fifties and sixties music, and I was thrilled because that's what I was into. And I would sit there all day on Saturday and wait to hear songs like Poison Ivy and Little Egypt. That's one that maybe all Coaster fans don't know. You don't hear that one as often as you do Yakety Yak or Charlie Brown. But I but I would I would wait for those songs to come on the radio and they would take me to places I couldn't go otherwise. And <laughs> Now to be able to have the coasters play in my hometown, let alone be able to speak to one of you, I have to tell you it is a true honor. Thank you. It's a pleasure talking to you, Zach. It really is. Um, and I gather that you've never been to Withfield before, but I assume you've played in, in the area, North Carolina, Tennessee, South Carolina, all around like that. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. we've been to all 50 states and pretty near all, well, I would say all the cities in those 50 states mm-hmm. and a lot of the counties in those uh, uh, surrounding cities mm-hmm. uh, in the United States and abroad. So we've mm-hmm. been quite a few places in my 34 years uh, with the group. But is this indeed your first time to Withville? I believe it is. Well, I hope that you have a sellout crowd. At least, hopefully, when I get done promoting you, you will have a sellout crowd. If if I have anything to say about it, uh, well, I hope so too. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's um, you know we had the Drifters back in January. And uh-huh. and they were unbelievable, and I cannot wait for uh, the coasters to to uh, come in October. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. Now, your band goes under the name of Cornell Gunter's Coasters, and Correct. the reason being is he was your cousin. Uh, yes. And he is one of the members of the coasters who were inducted into the inaugural Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1987. Um, yes. What can you tell me about your cousin, maybe, that people uh, wouldn't know, that you think people should know about your cousin? Well, number one, uh, he was a... How would I put it? He was an outgoing person mm-hmm. um, and very outspoken and uh, very, very, very talented. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he, 
he was with the group for some number of years, and um, Cornell had a excuse me, he had a way of attracting um, people, and they were doing a show at the Sahara, and uh, he came out in a dress, high heel shoes, and a purse and a wig. As as Lucy Brown in their show, you know, for Charlie Brown, he came out as Lucy. All oh, right, okay. And, yeah, and the the owner of the hotel, who was at that time was Bill Bennett. He loved it because the people just went berserk over it. Right. But but a couple of the other members didn't like it. Uh, they didn't like that act in the show, so. They kind of got into a disagreement about it, and Cornell. So the owner said, "Well, I'll keep the show if y'all, you know, continue to do it because people are loving it. They they, they want to come back and see it again." So the rest of the guys disagreed. Cornell kept the show, and he continued to do that show. So he started billing himself as Cornell Gunter's coasters because uh, they all had the right to use the name coasters as long as they put their name or something in front of the coaster. They didn't say the coasters because the coasters would be all four of them together. Right. And that was yeah. not going to happen again. So they, you had to do variations of the coasters. Right. Exactly. So, so you being his cousin, is that how you inherited Cornell Gunter's um, coasters, I'm assuming? Yes. Uh, his sister Shirley... Uh, you know, Shirley had a hit record too. Shirley uh, Gunter, Lucy Oop, and um, excuse me, she uh, lived there in Las Vegas when we got the contract to be um, the headliner at the Congo Showroom at the Sahara Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And um, she gave permission for um, my company to use uh, Carnell's name, and she had me as the executive administrator of that contract so that's how uh, I got to be uh, in the position that I am as far as uh, handling the business part I became the lead singer for the group back in 1990 uh, 91 actually be exactly mm -hmm. um, when Cornell was killed in 1990 by mistaken identity is that right? I knew that he was shot in his vehicle, but I could not find out why. But he, he was he was mistaken for someone else, right? Yeah, he was driving someone else's car. And uh, apparently that someone else has some kind of affiliation or connection to some gang or another there in Las Vegas. Right. And that person... Uh, they thought that Cornell was the person that was driving the car. They didn't even, basically, according to the uh, convenience store clerk, they didn't even try to see who it was. They just drove up and started shooting the car. Yeah, right. And Cornell was driving, yes. That's 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 yeah. a, such a tragedy. What do you what do you remember personally about your cousin? Well, personally, mm -hmm. uh, he he was gay mm -hmm. and. He was very, um, uh, like I say, he was very outspoken. He, he was mm -hmm. he was a person. Um, he, he was funny, and he couldn't you couldn't be around him without laughing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he kept he kept you laughing. Very good. Yeah. Now you yourself have had a very interesting uh, musical career. You were born in Georgia, based on what I could find. Um, yes. And you knew by the age of seven you wanted to be a musician, uh, a, a performer. And you made your debut at the Apollo Theater, is that correct? That's correct. Well, before then, um, at the age 14, mm -hmm. I put together a string band for the junior high school at that particular time it was called Doc Kemp High School mm -hmm. and we won several awards uh, for the school and I had three scholarships to go to college after uh, 
all these uh, uh, wins for the school. But uh, at the age 19, I was offered uh, a contract to go on the road with Rufus Thomas. And um, hmm. so I went to college for about six months, and that was it for me. I went on the road with Rufus Thomas, and <laughs> I learned most of my musical uh, knowledge from Rufus Thomas because after we was on the road with Rufus Thomas, um, Joe Simon joined the tour, and William Bell and Nancy Butt, and we also did um, some work for Carla Thomas, uh, Rufus's daughter. Right. And during that, that during that time, by the time I was twenty three years old, um, James Brown was tutoring me. Uh, how to write lyrics in uh, the correct form, and and we're talking about the James Brown, right? The, the James Brown, all right, the Godfather of Soul, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> Excuse me. And mm-hmm. that particular time, uh, we began to uh, do a lot of touring uh, back and forth with Rufus Thomas and several other groups, Tyrone Davis. Um, and William Bell, uh, Joe Simon, as I mentioned, and I got, I just, I just had this burning desire to perform on the stage at the Apollo, and I left Georgia and went there and became a seven-time winner at the Apollo. I won first place three times and became an Apollo favorite, and I'm a part of the Apollo archives at the Schoenberg Institute. All right, that gives us an idea of the kind of show we're in for in Whitfield on October 5th. Uh, You have an amazing repertoire of music on your own. Uh, You don't just do uh, coasters and 50s and 60s music. You cover everybody from... Marvin Gaye to Nat King Cole to just about anybody you can think of. So Absolutely. So uh, with that amazing repertoire, are we going to get to see some of that in Withville, or is it strictly going to be uh, coasters for us? Well, it, don't, it will be strictly coasters. All because, right. because we try, when we come to entertain, entertain our fans as a group, Cornell Gunther Coasters, we work hard to keep that same originality as the original Coasters did. And, you know, we we, we try to keep it fun, funny, and exciting all together. And, you know, some lucky lady will get the opportunity to come up on stage and sing and dance with us that night. Okay, very good. Yes, because instead of doing Charlie Brown, we're going to do Lucy Brown. Lucy Brown, all right. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, that sounds great. I'm sure there will be lots of eager ladies ready to be Lucy. Um, <laughs> um, now, as you well know uh, by now, I am a big fan of the music of, of that era. And, as I said, it's harder to find, well, radio is not what it used to be either, but it's harder to find, you know, typical oldies stations on the radio. It's hard to find stations that play 50s and 60s music. Do you find that there are, and this is sort of a rhetorical question, but do you find that there are still... Do you find that it is a diverse uh, age group that enjoys 50s music today that keeps it popular, or what do you think uh, keeps that music popular uh, among concert goers today? Well, it's, it's a, I wouldn't say that it's strange, but during that era... It was a era of innocence, right? And and purity and family oriented um, things going on, uh, and the music just reflected those things. And 
you don't have a whole lot of, I mean, back then you had, you had customs, you had values, you had traditions, and the music was part of that trend right. in that era. And, to, and then today, you have a lot of families that keep that type of, of family-oriented traditions and customs and values, they keep that sacred, and they, they, they pass it on to their children because a lot of times... At our shows, there are a lot of young people there, too. Mm-hmm. That... And I've talked to some of those young people after the show, and they just, and they said, we lo- I love this kind of music, you know, and, and it's, it, it comes down from the family uh, because the families, like I said, back in that era, they pass it on to their children, their children pass it on to them, those traditions, and that style of music. Well, you like some of today's music, too, but that music is embedded in the family traditions and customs uh, and values. Right. So when, when you see uh, grandma, grandpa, granddaughter, grandson, or daughter and son coming out to the show, it's typical. Yes, and that's, yeah. a, that's a wonderful thing. It is. It really is. Because, because we, that's why I say when we come and do our show, we do the coasters material because we know that the people come there to hear that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we have one cover tune in in the um, show that we'll do, which is "Dock of the Bay" by Otis Redding. The people love that song. Mm-hmm. Well, it kind of fits in uh, to that era of genera because uh, that was back in the '60s when Otis cut that song. Sure. You know, so it's, it's sort of fits in that genre that but that's uh and then we may do another cover tune or two we may but we keep it strictly coasters material very very good and yeah. um you uh, speaking of uh otis a legend in the 60s uh there was another legend that played uh saxophone on yakety yak uh king curtis and, and absolutely and he, he was a legend. And he was known as kind of the fifth coaster. And I knew who King Curtis was, but I didn't know he was the saxophone soloist for, for uh, was it Yakety Yak? Or was, it's Charlie Brown, wasn't it, that he played? Both of them. Oh, he, he was on both of them. Okay. Charlie Brown. Very and, good. And he also played the saxophone in Shopping for Clothes. Oh, very good. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, King Curtis was fantastic. Um, so, um, talking about 50s music, you know, you are singing music that was giving birth to a whole new genre of music. You know, nobody had ever heard of rock and roll before. It was being invented, and there was a as you were talking about um, going down through the generations and the families, there was an element of freedom in rock and roll, I think, that nobody had ever heard before. And you can def- yeah, you can definitely hear that in the Coaster's music. But yeah. uh, the I am, being a, a writer, I am um, a little bit obsessed with the 50s rock and roll scene. Um because it was just so brand new and exciting and chaotic and people dancing in the aisles people yeah. of people of different colors dancing in the aisles people of different age group dancing in the aisles before it was even deemed okay to do so that people were people were coming together not just as young people, old people, black people, white people, people were coming together as people to enjoy that music together. Now, I would assume that um, you are too... I'm not going to ask you how old you are, but I would assume you are too young to remember the 50s music scene, Uh, but what do you know... To be honest with you, no, I wasn't. Well, uh, what do you know about um, from your cousin or, or 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 about that working that particular music scene in the fifties? Well, in the fifties, um, 
number one, uh, that music had a spirit lifting element about it mm -hmm. because the people that sang and played that music were happy. Yeah, they were happy. Music, it, it, it was an escape. Mm -hmm. from any anxiety or de uh, the depression or sadness you may have been feeling that music would take you completely away from that and those musicians and singers were able to pass that on to the listener and the audiences and a lot of the uh, shows uh, that were done back then um, when people came to those shows they were already excited before they got there. And when they got there and heard the music, it was like just a whole other dimension. Um, because during that time, music was not um, as widespread listened to as it is today. Right. Say for, say for instance, that's where uh, Alan Freed came in at because Alan Freed helped break the barrier uh, that were, um, cast between radio stations in the south and the north because a lot of the music that you heard in what they call the chitlin circuit yes you didn't hear you didn't hear it in north carolina or or virginia or, or philadelphia or delaware you know you didn't hear it up there you only heard it in the chitlin circuit which was in georgia uh, alabama mississippi uh, in some places, and in some of those places, you didn't hear it all. You didn't hear it all the time. Right. But a person like Alan Free, Wolfman Jack, uh, they helped break that barrier, so radio listeners and radio owners would get more wattage, and and more people could hear those songs that were being played on radio. So it became that became another dimension back in the fifties and sixties. And on a, as on opposed to now, you can hear pretty much anything, anywhere. Right. And that's what I was getting ready to say. Back in the 50s, if you were here where I am in Whitville, and you got caught listening to that stuff, that yeah. what, you, you, you were going to get in trouble. And today, yeah, right. and today my 10-year-old daughter can hear things from Taylor Swift that she don't need to be hearing for another 10 years. So and it's and it's and it's broadcast on the radio. It's not it's not censored. It, it's even encouraged in some ways. So it exactly. it's it's amazing right. how flip flopped our culture right. is on right and wrong, and you know um, the fact that your cousin was you you're talking what well, you're talking about depression and anxieties. And there were a lot of depression and anxiety in those days, you know, exactly. for for exactly. for being black or being white or being being black as opposed to being white or yeah. be, being gay as opposed exactly. to being straight. You didn't talk about exactly. those things, and now right. and now those things are they they are broadcast all over everywhere. And exactly. but the right message is still not being the the message that we should be sending is still not being uh, relayed as it should. But it's it's amazing that, it's amazing how flip flop that is. That, excuse me. That's because the, the right message is not being um, uh, displayed because a lot of families are not holding on to the traditions, customs, and values that were sold uh, in those years. Yeah. They're not being passed down to the children like they were. Uh, I remember coming up, we we had to eat together. We went to church together. Yes. Now, if you wanted to go out uh, to some party or someplace like that, you have to have a mission. You have to have a certain time to be back home. And then on top of that, if you didn't, if you if you went out on Saturday night, you were allowed to go out on Saturday night because the Sunday before that you went to church. Right. Now, if you go out Saturday night and then you don't feel like going to church that Sunday, then you're not going out next weekend. That's right. You forget that. Right. You but now, children, 
It's like they're running the show. Right. They go when they want to, come when they want to, do what they want to do, and there's just mm-hmm. no more. There's hardly any guidance uh, for these children uh, that's coming up. There are very few families that are keeping those traditions with the with the children, and that's how um, groups like the Coastal Drippers and Plotters and and the, 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 the uh, uh, Johnny Maestro and the Brooklyn Bridge and Christy, all them. They, 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 the music is still uh, fun for people because they are keeping those traditions, customs, and values, and passing them down to their families. And as long as we have that stronghold. Uh, there will always be some hope for those that are not really getting the message. Amen. And, uh, you know, people w- would ask maybe, what we're talking about values, what does this have to do with the music? But it has everything to do with the music. Everything, because the, Everything to do with the music. Because the lyrics in every song reflects what that song is all about. Mm-hmm. And, and it, if that song is not about family traditions customs and values then it's sending another kind of message to the listener mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and if you and if you're not if you're not certain of what you're listening to or if when you're writing a song you're not certain what you're writing about then the listener is going to be just as confused as the writer right and it's not going to go anywhere it's not going to catch it's not going to go anywhere because it's got, it, it has to fit within the category uh, of the music of today uh, or yesterday, and it has to be liked or loved by the audience. Mm-hmm. And I can't think of a better way to end that interview. Early, I can't tell you what a pleasure it's been to talk with you. I hope you've enjoyed it half as much as I have. I surely have, Zach. I, I really have. And uh, they, you know, they they put me in the back. The wheelchair seats are in the back. But I do hope maybe I have a chance to say hello to you either before or after the show in October. Well, I tell you what, you're going to be there. Even though you're in the back, I'll do a shout out to you. Oh, I, that that would make my day. I appreciate you very much. And uh, and I I wish you a sellout. I can't wait for the show. It was a pleasure to talk to with you. It was a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much, Thank and you. good luck to you. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank B- you. Bye-bye.